welcome to our second installment of the 2021 QualiTalk series. I'm Mike Parsons. I'm the CEO of Qualitance, and this has to be one of the most exciting moments of the year because we are so delighted to announce that we have for you an emerging trends report for this beautiful year as springtime comes to us in Bucharest and a little bit of autumn here in the uh, more southern parts of the world. Um, we have lots of fresh springtime ideas to share with you today. But before we talk about the trends report, I would love to introduce to you somebody who's going to guide me through this maze of complexity, uh, through this world of collaboration and technology. Um, he is none other than Martin Unk from Deloitte. Martin, welcome. And for all of our uh, audience today, maybe you can say a little bit about the wonderful things you do with Deloitte. Thanks, Mike. I'm very, very happy to be here today uh, with you. Uh, so I am part of a strategic think tank called the Deloitte Center for the Edge, anchored and founded in Silicon Valley some 30 years ago, brought it to EMEA some seven years ago. I was employee number two. And I head up the strategy and the business part. And basically what I do, I strategize with our clients around long-term trends. So I basically develop a view of what the world and your relevant market will look like in 10 to 15 years from now. And then basically using that view to say, what are you going to do the next six to 12 months? So we are have a slightly different approach uh, to strategy. Um, and uh, that's what, what really gets me excited is to identify the relevant trends and shifts that we see happening and putting them into the context of any kind of institution or organization. So we're really happy to be here, Mike, and uh, to, to, to be joining this, uh, this Polytalk uh, session this morning. Thank, thanks, Martin. And uh, I have to say, you've got this very cool zoom in, zoom out way of looking at the future. Do you want to just mention that for, for the audience? Yeah, so basically it's, a, it's, a, it's an approach as well as a result. So what, what we help clients or any kind of organization with is to zoom out 10 to 15 years from now and ask basically two major questions. So the first one is what does the relevant market or industry that you want to play in look like in, on that time horizon? And if I have a, let's say, more distinct image or vision about that market reality, what kind of company and what kind of roles should I take on to be successful. So we're very much focused on growth on the zoom out and uncertainties. And I think some of the tech trends are, let's say, more relevant and will be more consistent going forward than others. And that's where we help companies to make sense of all those emerging developments, the shiny bits and pieces that we have out there, what is really relevant. And then we take that reality and we zoom in again, like I said, I said instead of making a business plan for the next five years, which I don't believe in, what are you going to do in the next six months? So what new initiatives are you going to launch that will accelerate movement towards that vision that you have? This is my direction of view. This is the way I see my company in 10 to 15 years. This is how I want to play, how I want to win in the market. That's why I need to do this now in addition to what I'm already doing. And maybe as a, on, on the back of that, you get an additional, I would say, a result is that you also have a very basic and good framework to assess where can I strengthen what I'm already doing? Where can I accelerate new innovations or product uh, uh, solutions that I'm working on? And which ones are actually not aligned? So where should I stop doing things in order to free up resources that I can invest in those more transformative initiatives that will help me create movement and acceleration? Well, that sounds fun. I would guess that I think we're probably today, we're going to zoom in together of yep. the two, bit of zooming in. Okay, great. Well, listen, before we get into our first trend, uh, and for everybody that has tuned in, we've got eight different trends, four across technology, and we've got four across uh, collaboration. Uh, Martin, I just wanted to get your thoughts on something that we discovered uh, through doing this survey and interviews. We literally hit every single continent. We got most industries into the into the surveys and to the interviews over a hundred individuals it, we've got a really good picture of what's happening in the world just before we get into the trends i think actually one of the biggest things that we 
uncovered in the report is that there really is a world of complexity as enterprises look to actually deploy more in the zoom in mode as they look to get things done in 2021 the big uh, the big word was complexity we're seeing um, everybody's trying to pipe together different platforms. And the reason that they're trying to put together so many different platforms is that not only was the trend of direct to customer kind of starting up in 2018, 2019, and really started to pick up post COVID, the other sort of more unexpected factor that we discovered in the report is that employees working from home has only added to more platforms, more complexity in the enterprise. And it's with this picture that I feel like we've entered into a new phase of digital transformation. One of our experts said, look, phase one of this wave of digital transformation was all about exploration. Oh, what could be innovation labs, post-it notes? But all of a sudden here in 2021, it is no longer about exploring technology. It's no longer about exploring digital transformation, but rather it's about executing. And I think this is the context of the trends. How do you see this, perhaps this second wave with all of this complexity? Is this something that you're seeing when you're talking to clients? How, how real and, and emerging is this? Oh, Mike, it's, it's, it's very real. So everyone is focusing on, and maybe it's, maybe it's a little bit of a semantic um, way of addressing this, but execution for me is about putting technology at work. So how do I mm. make technology work for me? It's not necessarily only about executing and implementing and working very hard action-wise, but what, I'm what am I actually trying to solve with technology? What is the problem? And for me, that's why I, I'm a strategist. So I always do step, one step back. What is the problem that you're trying to solve and which kind mm. of technology or tools that we have at our hands? And I think the opportunity is amazing, but you have to be selective and make choices about where to work with what kind of technology. And if you have at least the, 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 the room and the space to do one step back, think about it, make sense of all this, and then execute, you are in a very, very good place. And then of course, mm. I'll hand over to what you do very well is actually doing that in a very iterative and very well way, but just starting to execute without actually thinking is I think maybe still the biggest mistake, and yes. as, well, as well as that companies have been quite, I would say, uh, disappointed. Let's say when I started five, four, five years ago, everyone was about technology and exploring, but also about actually executing already without actually understanding what they were dealing with. And they became, came out quite disappointed. So we're now basically a little bit back to square one, but again, right. we don't have the time to actually let's say spend another year in exploration, we have to do it very quickly, very iteratively. Um, so yeah, I think uh, you're completely right, but still it has to be done in a very smart way, I would say. Well, I think, I think to build on what you just said, I think you're, you're, you're painting the picture that it's not just about a product that delights customers. It's, uh, it's about, uh, if, if that was, if that's desirability, I think what we are challenged with now is we must make sure that it is both technically feasible and viable for the business. Sure. And once you get those three vectors together, Martin, that is one tricky situation, isn't it? It is, it is. And I think that yesterday was in a session and one of the speakers there said, they are building autonomous vehicles, 3D printed autonomous vehicles. He said, what we do is responsible iteration to safety. And that would speak to you, uh, I think, Mike, is that they say we cannot deliver a 100% solution, but we have to be, as, let's say, responsible in the level of safety that we provide. But if we would basically wait until it's 200% safe, we would never get anything out. And then you're basically right. too late. So yes. I, I think those are really nice phrase. And whether it's about safety, about functionality, it has to be responsible don't just put something out, but you need to get things right. out very, very quickly to test it. Well, I, I think you've brought us to the perfect moment where we should launch into our first responsible trend, Martin. <laughs> so um, let's talk about uh, four tech trends. And we're going to start with 
technology and product. And the first one is UX consistency. So obviously we surveyed and interviewed over a hundred different people around the world. And we said to them, hey, so you're, you're launching a product from the whole entire, if you will, the front end of the product. What's the biggest challenge? And you know what was really fascinating? It wasn't like um, device compatibility or making it mobile responsive. People are saying now that the journeys are getting so big in the products, actually the single biggest challenge with products, this is trend number one, was UX consistency, enormously challenging. And what's really fascinating is that UX consistency, I believe, and I want to, this is sort of my hypothesis from the data, and I, I'm really interested to think what you see, Man, but have a look at this chart. You'll see here that providing support and device uh, compatibility, the yellow box and the gray box, they're minuscule when we compared to what is the most common user experience problem you have as a product manufacturer. UX consistency is like, like shouting out at number one. I think that's because customers and employees are demanding end-to-end -end journeys. So we, we can't cut corners. We have to actually have an elegant, seamless experience right from the start to the finish. So I think this is why all of a sudden UX as consistency has come up. Now, if we had done this survey, Martin, maybe five, eight years ago, I think the biggest thing we would have heard is making my website render in a mobile browser. Yeah. But it's totally turned around. I mean, how do you digest this, this important fact that now actually it's this UX consistency. It's not about making it work on the mobile browser. Why, why do you think that is? I think maybe there, there are a few things. First of all, there are, of course, there are very good examples of UX consistent experiences out there. So, mm. uh, especially, let's say, of course, all the unicorns or let's say the, the, the new ventures in the mobile or the pure online players have nailed this very, very well. For the, let's say, I would say more incumbents, I still think there's a big challenge. Uh, they, they understand that they need to do it. But what I notice is that and we call this the dark side of digital technology for incumbents. It is that okay. it's still trying to push the same kind of offerings in an online or digital way, instead of using the user as a source for the future design of the experience, the products, the solutions. This is a mutual set way where you can basically interact and not only just create a or push a UX experience. It's also about collecting insights on how people deal with that. And the majority of the people that I work with are so focused on extracting, let's say, more information yes. instead of having a conversation, a digital conversation with their users, right. that they forget all about it's all about them and that they feel trusted, uh, let's say, acknowledged, but also yes. the feedback that they have. And I think that's the next... Yes. I would say a step that we need to make. How do you include them in your next level UX uh, yes. consistent experience? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great point. So what, um, what I would argue to give you a, a very simple example of this playing out is you see Revolut uh, in, the, in the banking sector and financial services offers everything in one app. But actually many of us who work with traditional banks, many of us who have traditional banks as our personal banks, often will say, oh, if you want to invest in stocks, you need to use this app. If you want to actually use the banking, that's a separate app. So even you see the, the breakdown in consistency, even from the get-go there, um, and sure, there are legacy systems behind all of that. But I would say, if you want to overcome that, uh, my proposition and my advice for any, uh, any organization trying to build a product is start by not just thinking about what products and services you need to offer, but to start on the other side. What do our customers need? And you can determine that through surveys, one-on-one -on -one user interviews, or my favorite thing, which I talk a lot about, Matt, you know this, rapid prototyping. Get in the room and co-create it with them there. Get their feedback, iterate, do it better step-by-step. Step. It's actually, it's not that hard to do You've just got to make it a priority. 
and not just guess what the interface should be, right? Yeah, I, I agree. It's also quite often quite scary. That's, that's what I see. People find it very scary to open up and to be, uh, I think, vulnerable to actually failing. And I don't like the word failing because it's being misused in different kinds of context, but actually yeah. that they end up with a 60% version, but you learn so much. Um, so that, that, that's one element. And the other one is that think beyond the product. Most time it's not about the product, it's about the way you mm. use the product. So if you mm. go to a very Porsche, or let's say if you go to Four Seasons Hotel, it's not about the room that you book and the price that you pay, it's the experience that you get. And if you can think beyond the product, then you're actually, I think, at the heart of UX. Uh, yes. Quite often people still stuck very much about the color of the product and how it looks, etc. It's how you use it. I think that that's what I learned from from, from, from Amazon Web Services is all about how do people unpack a product? How would they start basically configuring it, using it? And that is the most important part. Uh, and then of course, all the other elements are important, but not as important as it used to be. I think that's where the big shift is from the traditional yeah. product um, identification and how we now look at how people are using products and services. That's a great point. Well, talking about things that shift, Martin, we're about to get into one of the biggest pain points that we discovered in this survey. To, to share with you, Martin, I was surprised that for most uh, areas um, that we kind of investigated, we discovered that there were some pretty clear messages. And, and look, one of the things that came back really clearly in this next trend is that implementation is where we can expect things to get a little tough. So here's the breakdown of trend number two, which is all about expecting real tough uh, situations when we get into implementation. So, you know, the interesting thing here is I think people find themselves um, looking around in the world um, and investigating new technologies and look, finding out and researching is is far from the hardest thing all of the pain is consolidated around the point the moment of truth martin when we get to that moment where we have to choose the technology and put something from the outside in and it gets really really hard now in talking to the guys at microsoft we had a big aha here the problem in implementation is not only with the individual technology itself. That has different impl implement, uh, implications, such as making sure that the requirements are there and, and setting it up. But it's when you have to make CRM work with the CMS to connect to the ERP, this is when those adjacent connections, the web services, the integrations, this is where it gets really tricky. And in particular, this is really revealing. We just spoke about having a universal, delightful user experience on the front end. One entry point, it's all there. But what that is masking is in the back end, there's multiple systems working in concert with each other to produce a single user experience on the front end for the customer. So we found that because you're playing with all of these different platforms, you're getting into a real, real traffic jam. So have a look here, the orange bar and the yellow bar are the two big ones. It's aligning, okay, is this the one that's gonna serve our business goal? That's very interesting because it actually comes back to the point you were making it earlier. Is it going to work? Not just function, but is this a viable piece of technology? But then actually getting something from the outside in, that is where the pain really exists. But what's interesting here, when we're ranking in difficulty using new technology, what you can see on this chart, it's pretty much the whole thing is not that easy because every, everyone's saying, actually, everything's pretty hard. What, what are your thoughts on this conundrum? Everyone gets excited about the technology, Martin, and then it's like, oh, then now we have to make it happen. So, so, so maybe a few things. So the first one is what, 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 you, what you see in this graph, maybe we are constantly stacking solutions, technology solutions on top of each other. So, and that, that's not strange. And we are used to basically incre incrementally improving our, I would say, IT systems. 
Um, but I would like to make the difference between IT and digital. Digital for me is all about users, experiences, functionality, convenience. And IT is about hardware, software. It's about that it has to be work seamlessly, et cetera. So if you want to do something more transformative on the digital side, what we strongly believe in, basically cutting that loose from your core business and your core IT. And I think it speaks to your let's say, imagination that if you build a MVP on a real transformative digital platform or solution, that you do it completely separate, but leveraging still yeah. the core capabilities of the organization, not the IT. But this, I mean, yes. this, what are you all about that you can bring into this, what we call an app? So it's a new business completely mm -hmm. founded on the digital beliefs and the digital understanding, mm -hmm. but quite fundamentally different from typical core businesses that are driven on efficiency and structures and procedures. If you mix those two, you're in a very, very bad place. So, yes, yeah, I agree. And I just want to build on that. I don't see a lot of companies prepared to go off platform for the new. They are invariably looking at ways to put it back in the old system. Yeah. How do we solve for this? What, what advice do you have um, for creating these little spin outs? Yeah, so for, for us, as I said, we discussed it previously as well in earlier talk, we don't believe in skunk war. So, so completely disconnecting it. For us, it's an edge, and because the metrics, the way of working, the governance is so fundamentally different, you have to basically make this disconnect. So you put it on the edge mm -hmm. of your business, and the trick is to scale it as quickly as possible to relevance. And relevance yes. essentially is not a monetary relevance, so it's not a return on investment, it's speed. It's from going from zero to one, from one to 100 right. in a very short amount of time, showcasing that you can create something out of nothing. And that will potentially be a new business. And the biggest, yeah. I would say, trick is to make sure that you have protection from the, from the top. That the moment people start asking when this new business is going to be internalized again, and they say, no, yeah. we're not going to do that. We want to make it yes. even bigger than our current core business, if possible. Yes. And that's why we oh, okay. need to have it on the edge as long as possible and have it operational in its own merits rather than sucking it back into the core business and killing it. Yes, yeah, because it's, it's, it's really enormously challenging to say to a new product team, a transformative project, to say to them, hey, we want you to go out and be like a unicorn, but you're going to be constrained by all the old parameters of how we do business how could you possibly create the new business by doing things like the old business yeah and i think that there is and there's this notion of uh, what we would call venturing 2.0 so instead of let's say internalizing or hiring new digital people that are quite different from your traditional kind of talent that you have why not partner up or scout companies that will help you accelerate rather than just buying them and hoping right. that it will survive. I've seen very ugly examples of very successful digital ventures being bought by large corporations, put into the basement to work on IT functionality or digital solutions, and were dead within a year. So yeah. it's not, not, not only, let's say, that this is, let's say, a bad example, it's just a waste of the energy and the competencies of the people that you're collaborating with. But collaboration yes. for us is the ideal leverage in a digital age to create speed and acceleration and movement. Yeah. I like your idea of putting them on the edge, not over the edge. I think, I think that's something um, to, uh, that, that we can really take, take on board. But you know, I want to bring us to the next trend because you mentioned what happens, uh, the things that uh, get driven uh, by the internal teams, the IT teams. Um, and uh, before I do that, I want to give a big uh, production shout out to all the people that have helped uh, produce this report. So a big thing, thank you to all the Qualitans team, but special shout outs to Amelia, uh, to Mark and to Bridie, who have all really helped us uh, produce such a, a great report. And also, um, I really encourage everybody to jump in and 
um, share their questions because um, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end of this. So um, I can promise everybody you're going to get a chance to ask all the tricky questions to Martin and all the easy ones, I'll take care of those. Okay, let's get on to the, to the third trend of our report. Okay, this is squarely, Martin. This is squarely in the hands of IT department. It's a tricky one. It's the single source of truth. Oh my gosh, we got such a clear message on this one. So I want you to imagine, Martin, this is what everybody is trying to avoid, but most companies do this. I want you to imagine that somebody is working at an unusual hour. Let's say it's early in the morning. It's maybe seven o'clock. Nobody else is at their desks. And let's say they're a configurator or an engineer putting together a new product and they need some critical information. They need a user story that should be um, really uh, containing the information they need to either configure or program this particular element of the product. So what do they do? They go to the Google Drive, they go to the OneDrive, they have a look in their inbox, and you know what? They can't find the information. So they get stuck. They're unable to continue. So what do they do, Martin? They send the dreaded thing, the email. So they say, dear, dear Martin, I have a real problem. I can't seem to find the information. Can you share me the latest instructions and user story for this feature? This is breaking, this is an organization breaking down, definitely not being agile. So what we want to do is we want to um, kind of break down this single source of truth thing. But before we do that, have a look at this data. So we ask people, which of the following activities is the most challenging for your business when trying to produce work with teammates? And there you have it. Look at finding the single source of truth is way out in front. Now, Amelia, if you wouldn't mind going back to the previous slide, there's some key points here that I want to point out. Martin, I want to get your thoughts on this, but I just want to paint you a picture of what we've discovered from the report. Access alone is now a bit of a challenge for the single source of truth because people are not all on the office on the, right, on, on the same network accessing technology. They're all over the place. Then two, if everybody does have access, there's a question of the quality, is it up to date, version control, all of those uh, rights and permissions that need to happen on top of a single source of truth. So before we talk about the, the benefits that we discovered of this, why do you think single source of truth, you saw it in the data, it's still such a big issue. Why is that? What, what is the thing that um, organizations struggle with when it comes to having a single source of truth? So I actually don't know what the actual cause is of the fact. So what I see is the, the results. So why people are bothered with this currently, I would say, is because we spend so much time and there's so much information overload that whenever there is a request and we can't find it, we're going to create it and recreate it. And that, that basically, everyone I think is aware of the fact that we spend a lot of time in finding the right information to a request. So I think that the understanding of if there would be a one single source of information or data, that would help me tremendously. And the other one is I think you're linking back to the first uh, topic that we discussed. I think that it's crucial when you look at the importance of UX. If you, if I build a chatbot and a voice enabled solution and I don't can, I can't rely on a single source of truth, my UX will still be clunky and not necessarily consistent yes. over the whole yes. end journey. So this is, a, I would say, a prerequisite for doing UX consistently well. Yeah. I don't actually know, because I think that's a little bit also in the, the domain definition of, uh, of, 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 of it's a little bit more technical than, than, than I'm normally working at. But I do see a battle, again, between people in more traditional and maybe IT functions and say, we decide who gets access to what. When, when for example, right. if you look at data democracy or functionality democracy, that is something that basically is a big fear. Basically, it's, I think it's a fear play for people that traditionally are in control of allocating rights to specific yes, right. sources of information. 
And fear is, in, especially in middle layer organizations, never a good way because then you activate yeah. what we call the antibodies of change and they will do whatever it takes to <laughs> for, make sure that you don't get to this really democratized access yes. to information and data on the forefront of your business. Yeah, and, and we should shout out to OMV Petrom, who we both work with, because they've got their digital democracy program, which is all talking about enabling these digital citizens. Yeah. And so I think, I think that's an example of a company that is really attacking this. I think I want you to imagine that we had a, a let's call it the pessimistic IT manager, reluctant to give access and permission. I think we found some answers in the data. One, if you have a look at uh, BCR Arista, they discovered that by giving a single source of truth, that not only there were benefits for employees, which we'll come to in a second, but here's the thing, they were able to give better financial advice to their customers. And they got an opportunity to build more trust because their advice was better. If they weren't doing, you know, that typical thing where you, um, you have one interaction with a brand, say on their call center, and then you go in store and both of those people cannot access the same information. So what does the second person you see? I'm sorry, could you explain everything to me again, even though you did it on the phone yesterday, right? Single source of truth is the solution to this. So this is my business case, which you can actually delight by delighting your employees, you can delight your customers too. What we also discovered is that autonomy was a huge benefit when people truly had quality access to a single source of truth. Completely uh, makes sense, uh, Mike. Yes, we're making too much sense. We need to agree, we disagree with each other more. Let's let's try and do that on the next trend. Let's do this on the next trend. So this is the fourth product and technology trend. And look, Martin, we went out into the world and we said, tell us what technologies are you thinking about? What has piqued your interest for short-term, near-term implementation? And it was a decisive winner. It was no code solutions. So if you if you have a look here. Uh, no code is like, I mean, doing so well. In fact, you know, I would have thought cloud first solutions would be the easy winner here, but no code has even surpassed cloud. So Martin, if you're thinking of a startup in your spare time, because I know, hey, you're only a managing partner at Deloitte, you should have a lot of spare time. You can, uh, you can make a no code uh, uh, solution. I think it will do great. But um, some interesting things here is that it really speaks to the thing that we've talked about a lot, complexity. By using a no-code solution, there's a big promise here of less effort, faster time to market, more adaptive. I would even say to your first point around UX consistency, you can be really responsive to customer requirements, customer needs, because you're able to turn around updates, fixes, changes far quicker than what you might have been able to do normally. So. I want to get your thoughts on no code before we actually got some really good advice, some almost cautionary advice as well about no code. But first, what are your thoughts on, on why people are so excited about no code solutions? I'm mean, maybe also bridging it to the next topic. So I would, let's say, turn it around. So if I look at, I, I'm, I'm not a coder, so I can't do it. So what I see is that going back to what I previously said about the information overload. I think we need to accelerate the amount of applications that will help us with the information overload. And I think that no-code solutions are a very good way to enable, again, a lot of people to build functionality applications or solutions that will help us doing that. Otherwise, and that links a little bit into what the, the topic that is really close to my heart, the future of work, is that if we don't do that, we will, will be looking at a workforce that is completely digitally overloaded and have no opportunities actually to put their real capabilities to work, like creativity, empathy, curiosity, all those more foundational things that are all intrinsic to the human. We are now basically, I would say, compressing by having so much information that they basically are still working in those Excel files to make, trying to make sense of all of that. I think this might be a yeah. different way in 
getting out of this gridlock of more and more information uh, inputs and the request to respond to that, while this might be a solution to basically load off a little bit of that response part. Yeah, so, so it's like, obviously it's like, Zen Nirvana is the promise, right, of, of these no code solutions. I think the, 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 the one note I want to make before we go into the second part of our, our trends is that make sure you got your business rules and your business processes down before you just jump into no code. And don't forget, it's all about how you set it up. It's about the smarts, the intelligence you put into no code is the outputs relate directly to that. So don't just think you can click your fingers and you have a full BI power app. It's all great. No, you got to put some, some work into it. Well, Martin, this brings us to the second part of our, our survey. Now, traditionally for the last four years, we have only dealt with tech trends, but we feel that the, the people side, if, if you will, if the tech side is all about the platforms, then now we need to talk about the people that are going to run those platforms and, and how we work. I think we're all super aware that there are lots of new ways of working. And we got a fantastic uh, uh, starting point here, which is for our first thing, which is all about getting people singing the same song. So this is really a story of alignment. And what you'll see here is there is this massive need when we're asking people like what's the most challenging thing about collaboration it comes down to connection and alignment these are two clear needs in the organization now if we can just go back to the previous slide before this i want to show you some of the call outs that we have around this so we spoke with ing bank romania and overdue slavoya who runs their uh, business marketing he was saying that it was, it was all about uh, seeing your product team as, uh, as a, like a band and you've got to get them all singing the same song. And if we kind of bring that into a very pragmatic uh, term, if you and I were to join an existing team, that team would have a way of thinking and a way of working that we need to normalize to, right? You and I need to adopt into that. And so what he was pointing out is if you want to seek alignment, you need to become really explicit and demonstrative of how you think and work as a team, particularly to not only reinforce to the existing team, but particularly it's like that norming, forming and storming. You really have to actually come together and agree on how you think and work as a team. That needs to be an explicit action. And he gave some fantastic advice that I want to, I want to picture it to you, man. He said their success lays in doing two things, that product leaders get the team together every single day. So it's a daily ritual. So this is your classic kind of stand-up uh, scrum kind of situation. But his reference to the band thing comes to, it is very important to see ourselves as guides within a team. You are guiding your teammates on how to think and how to work. It's mutual, you're, you're building this connectivity. This is how you're getting on the same page. So that when you have done this well, you might've been the front man in the band at the start, but slowly after time, you start kind of going to the back, maybe just humming along. And then if you've done a great job, they're all singing great and they don't even need you to sing. So this is, like a very beautiful metaphor, I think, for how we should see our roles in getting everyone on the same page. As you hear this, this and this big theme of alignment within the team, so people truly do think and work in the same way, what's been your experience when you've seen teams do this well? Well, so two things. So the first one, it is all about having a very clear understanding of what is your ambition or the objective of the goal that you're working on as a team. And again, yesterday I was in session and I will refer, let's say, use his words, it was about Fred Kaufman. And that's where I think we disagree a little bit about, let's say, we have to band, uh, sing the same song. It depends a little bit on what your objective is. If you want to win, and this is, this is a great experiment, there was this uh, rowing team and they were, they were using, um, um, how do you call it? Mental um, um, uh, what, what, what do you do? Um, 
meditation to basically basically see yeah. all the things. And they actually performed less. They were very in sync, but that didn't help them win. So if you look at, oh. so if you want to win, you have to basically allow for some optimization in the team. And I think it's a very interesting notion that if you, if you are collaborating very well, that might be the solution because the goal is to actually, that will help you to fulfill your goal. Right. But sometimes yes. if you want to win or get something out, you just need to align that everyone in the team needs to think about the goal and not his own task. It's a question about what is your job? Right. And I think mm. back to the reference, and I, I love this uh, the sense is uh, for, again from Amazon Web Services, they say, we build stuff. So we hire builders. Don't hire managers if you want to build stuff. So right. I think it's, a, it's, it's of course, it's a, it's a very simple mechanism, but I think there's a lot of truth in this. And of course, it also is true what you are saying and what, got, what you got out of the survey, but having very explicit alignment on this is the goal. If we want to win, even the defenders in a, in a soccer team have to yes. help make goals, not just defend. Yes. Because otherwise you will never win. So this, I think there's so, a to that. Yeah, this is perfect because we're going to come to it because this is going to be the third collaboration theme around engagement. And then the fourth one, which is sharing success. So you're, you're, you're almost accelerating us. This is perfect. <laughs> So now I want to talk about how you get a good team to great in terms of skills. And this is the next trend that we discovered. It's all about learning. And I am, this is right up my alley. I love this stuff. But here's the idea. Um, Martin, what we discovered in the report is there's a lot of new questions, a lot of new skills to learn. Perhaps you might even go as far as saying more than ever. And Here's the interesting thing. If we say to people, hey, how does it go trying to find a case study, read a white paper? People are fine. Like if you look here, when we ask them about how they learn, the second bar is researching case studies. But look above that. When we said learning a specific skill with a person who knows but is too busy, would you look at how massive the signal is there? I mean, basically... Uh, if we go back to the previous slide for a second, the organization is getting hamstrung. Uh, it's, it's totally um, boxed in because there's like one individual is the single source of truth, but they're too busy because they're the single source of truth. They're the expert. So this is where the call to action is to train the trainers and to always be learning. In fact, this is what I'd love to get your thoughts on. Depending on the time of day, you might be a student. And then later in the day, maybe you're the teacher. But I think what we have to accept now is a new mode when we think about learning. It's not just the occasional offsite, once a quarter or once a year. It's like we've been put in fast forward. We are now constantly learning, but particularly the role we need to take is we are both always teachers and students. So we might be learning from others or teaching others at any given time. What are your thoughts on this whole new world of learning? Uh, it has been foundational to the center's uh, view. And we, we always mentioned that, I'd say from 30 years ago already, it was like we have to move from scalable efficiency to scalable learning as an organizational paradigm. Mm. And what we mean by that, and I, say, I think it's all there, but it's it, on top of the skilling, I would say it's about behavior. So what we call forward learning so how do we acquire new skills and knowledge and know-how to deal with uncertain new um, circumstances and i think that is an addition so behavior is a much more powerful way of navigating your environment your business etc than just skills i think both are needs to be in harmony but i would add behavior as a as a, as a very important one to actually scale learning in an organization. And with that, I also think that quite a lot of organizations are so much focused on avoiding friction or avoiding stress. Um, and I think actually that if you look at stress, it's actually a very good, um, uh, I would say, reason to grow. 
if you have no pressure on you, the actually the urgency to start exploring how to deal with that stress, that will create growth. If nothing happens, it's all safe. You take some medicine, all fine. And that's where basically companies get stuck and just put their head in the sand, ignore everything else, but it's still going well. This is not, it's, it's a nice opportunity. For us, it's not an opportunity. It's an imperative that you have to basically go forward, grow, learn, etc. Yes. If you don't yes. see that, and if you just see it as an opportunity, but yeah, you're too, too busy today. There's so many things going on. Let's first thing is that we'll look at the opportunity next year. Yeah, then you're basically in a very bad place. I think if you can get out of mm. that mindset and apply uh, whatever we want to call the growth mindset and maybe embrace friction and stress sometimes uh yes be a yeah. really good way to um to start having learning as a foundation rather than something that you put on top of the organization as a program or something else that's a great point um the, marianne ignat who contributed to to the report uh, talked about this healthy stretch goal when challenging his team members to not only be students, to, but to also be teachers. Yeah. And I think that's a, it's, it's really good, a healthy stretch goal, lots of growth. Don't deny the power of, of learning. Now, this brings me, we've got two more trends and I wanna make sure everybody understands, yeah. hit the Q&A button. We got a lot of people on the webinar, hit that Q&A button, send in your tricky questions because Amelia loves sorting through tricky questions. She can never have enough tricky questions. Um, so please hit that Q and A button. It's sort of down here and um, send in your questions because as I said, Martin has promised to answer all the tricky ones <laughs> himself. Okay, two more to go. And um, now we're gonna bring it really home uh, on getting results. And this next big trend from the report, Martin, this one is all about engagement. And what's fascinating is we start to see this, the way that alignment, engagement, collaboration, so deeply intertwined with themes of learning and ownership and vision. This is really interesting. So in the report, we got this really distinct message. I mean, again, look at this one, Martin. Getting people engaged and in particular in brainstorm contributions. And I think maybe the reference to getting people out of their inboxes so that they can be present, so that they can be engaged was the single biggest challenge like huge distance between that and second place. Now, if we go back a slide, we'll have a look at some of the key themes in this. So the, for me, the, the engagement thing is, is really actually starting with a theme that has really come up over the last year, which is inclusivity. And what we found that if you truly wanna get people owning the purpose of a team or the company, it starts by inviting everybody in to participate. This is no longer you on the podium, rather it is about you as a leader serving all the people around you and truly inviting all people and ideas into a project, a product or an organization. And if you do this and you can say to them, I want you to challenge our vision, improve our vision and own our vision, whether it's a product vision or whether it's a company wide vision. Martin, what are your thoughts on how we get people really engaged? How do we get contribution? How do we get ownership? How do we bring them into the present? How do we get them out of their inboxes and Zoom fatigue? What, what are you seeing that's really working around this topic? I think that's interesting. So I, I run a current, it's actually an exploration out, around a topic that we have called just as a working title, Connected Organization. And in the light of COVID, we saw, okay, what everyone's talking about losing connection and how to reestablish connection. And then of course we came up with all those little bit artificial measures that helped a bit, but didn't really solve the bigger problem that was already there. And so underlying a bigger trend of, um, I would say, how do you make sure that a person is connected to a organization and what actually is that? Right. And one of the elements, of course, that came up, especially from the top-down leaderships and the CEOs that we've been talking to is about, okay, we need to basically embrace purpose. But if you then talk to younger people, they say, that's very nice talking about purpose if you are a director or a vice president. Yeah. But we just yes. have to do hard work. 
So how do you basically cascade the purpose down into the organization in such a way that people actually see that that purpose is being lived in a authentic way at all levels? I think that, right. that comes to the notion of collaboration needs symbiosis. It needs mm -hmm. some kind of a mutual, and it can be at a very small level and at a team level with five people. If you don't have that mutual interest, that mutual dependency on getting things done, people will get out the moment, let's say, it's the transaction part is over. So if I get my share of reward or return, whatever it is, if I can move beyond transaction, you get real engagement because people will actually work harder for a collective goal. Because if you step out, everyone will step out. So hmm. I think that's where around engagement, there's a very, very powerful element. The biggest challenge is how do we make that work from a yes. organization that has been built up in, for, for in, in legacy structures and systems and governance and KPIs. I think that is the current also challenge that I'm faced with, can I find foundational interventions that actually will help solve these kind of really key questions to engagement? Yeah, and um, look for our audience. If you've got any questions on engagement, hit us up in the Q&A box. I can see the questions coming in. Thank you for that. I would say, Martin, if it makes you feel any better, we, we hit multiple industries, multiple countries, everyone's got an engagement challenge so don't worry <laughs> we're not alone we're not alone and and you know the interesting thing that we picked up on is this idea of getting everyone included and involved uh there's a little thing here is that because we're no uh we're far less in the office there's far less impromptu water cooler coffee machine conversations what we recognized from the report is that was where a lot of engagement and alignment is happening but, but there's far less of that. So unintentionally, people are feeling left out because they're not bumping into you at the water cooler. So this, this is a very interesting challenge that we now have due to hybrid work. So this is something I don't think is going away and it emphasizes engagement. But this brings me to something else I wanna emphasize, which is our last trend before we go to Q and A. Um, this one is a big one. This one is all about sharing success so what's interesting is framing success is actually really important here um, we're not talking about hey uh we just did 10 million euros yesterday on our e-commerce store no actually it's about learning and growing together whether it's big or small whether it's a personal uh growth or whether it's a team growth it's about those things should be celebrated because it's the those are the journey moments that get you to the objective. So a really big emphasis there. And I think what was fascinating to learn is it's really important, big or small, that it's shared. I mean, this is the data. Have a look at this. Once again, how do I make team members feel part of the team and share in this success? Huge signal here. Um, people are really trying to wrap their brains around much like you said, meaningful interventions to get people engaged. It's also meaningful moments to celebrate your success, the team's success, our success. Now, if we just go back a, a slide, what I want to um, riff on here is two bits of practical advice before we get your comments. One, big success stories came when success is shared publicly. And when teams are, are celebrating each other's success organically, actually the difference maker was when peers recommend, recognize, and share the success of their other peers. That's the very best form of connection. Yeah, maybe, maybe one, one notion also to the, to the, to the previous uh, topic, uh, Mike, is what you see now is that culture is basically gone. So people are at home. So the whole cultural aspect of the water cooler, but also sharing the success, bumping into a colleague, this atmosphere of engagement at the office with your peers in your team, the cultural, and we, we, we found it as well within the lawyer, that cultural aspect is very, for, for young people, it's 50% of their job is culture, which is not as much, I would say, in the more leadership or more senior function, but for the, I would say, the first part of our pyramid, it's 50% culture. And we right. call it the, 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 the work hard, play hard. 
the work hard is still there, the play hard is gone. <laughs> so we have to accommodate, we have to compensate for that. And that is typically hard work. Um, but we have to be aware that it's not just something that we might think about, it's a necessity if we want to keep talent in our company, being engaged and basically contributing to success. Otherwise, otherwise they will tap out and say, okay, guys, I, was, I would choose another an alternative. Yeah, very, very good. Uh, I, can't, I can't believe all the players gone out of Deloitte, Martin. I, there, there must be a little bit of play left. Come on. <laughs> okay, we got... We got some great questions. Um, let's quickly do those. Um, okay, lots here. Okay, first of all, this one's from Andre. He says, hi, great talk. Martin was making lots of sense. Mike wasn't. I'm joking. Yeah. He, it would be very interesting, he says, uh, in your views about a possible feasible setup. This one's going to be for you, Martin. In an organization in order to be agile enough in order to cope with all these trends and at the same time to deliver digital initiatives per strategy. So he's really asking about organizational setup. So yeah. Martin, what are your thoughts? We've got to be agile. We, we, we talk about working in this bottom up way, but you reference some organizational setup. Maybe you want to talk about that a little bit for Andre. Yeah, there, there, there's just one thing that you have to bear in mind and I call it governance. So pay very much attention to governance because it will kill everything that you want to achieve with the people that you have, even if they are great, it's all about governance. So we, we have this notion of, especially in a more corporate environment of double standard metrics. What we mean by that is that make sure that you have a few metrics that are recognizable by the core business. And I would say the typical people that are like, okay, what's happening there? Is it, uh, let's say, is consuming my money or my budget? And then you have your own um, metrics. And those metrics are the ones that are only important. That's about speed and creating, creating proof points that you're on the right track. And back to the introduction. So in this zoom out, if you zoom in, if you look at the six months, this is not just trying stuff. It's every week delivering results, but not right. necessarily monetary. It's about we went from this to that. And now we, we learned this. If you can get yes. into that mindset, but it's if you report into the business, the business will say, what about my return? I put some money in this. When do I get yeah. my money back? So yeah. we strongly believe that if you, if you want to do something fundamentally different with different people, different kind of metrics, you have to report to the top. They have to protect you and you have to deliver. If you don't deliver, of course, you are, they are allowed to kill you. But if you deliver, you need someone to say, guys, Right. I will give them at least a year. And yeah. it is not easy. That's great. But mm -hmm. that's the first thing that you have to think about. If someone from the innovation department uh, says, let's set up a Google X kind of, and you report into me, you end up with incremental innovation. You don't end up with transformative businesses. And that, I think, is the key difference between an edge and just doing innovation in an institution. You're on fire, Martin. I'm going to hit you with some more. This is from a friend of ours in the UK. This is from Gurdeep. He says, Martin, as we know, many organizations are not fully agile. Many of the departments are still silo based. How do you bring them all to the same level quickly to make that change happen? So how do you take those you know, previous silos who've been throwing things over the fence at each other? How do you bring them together? Uh so maybe again, but it's about urgency and aspiration. So I don't believe in, so what I see a lot is questions, can you make my organization agile? No, agile for me is still a toolbox, which you have mm -hmm. to apply very wisely to certain elements of the organization where you can get very quick results using very effective agile methodologies or tools. So look mm -hmm. for that. And so you can have two choices. Either you go, uh, I would say, into the basement. No one cares. And you're basically trying out how to apply agile in your organization. Or you go into Big Bang and you say, OK, I will be very visible, but I will show to everyone how it should be done. And depending on your risk appetite and the way your organization is set up, you can choose either of them. Don't That's you can also right. yeah. do both, but I would say, in the majority of the more traditional organizations, I would go for the basement. If you're a successful <laughs> company, go with the garage. Make, make the garage okay. for the maintenance part agile. No one cares about services and the garage 
everyone is focused on the sales guys bringing in the money. And that's where we I love it. not be reactive and putting this, let's say, empty change hat on their, uh, on their, on their, on their, on their hat. It's a choice between the garage or the basement, Gurdeep. So there you go. Martin has answered it. Take your, take your choice. I've got two more that I'm going to do with you. We won't get time to do them all. This is a really uh, uh, kind of a quick yes, no one. And then I'm going to do another one. This is from Luca. Uh, do you think we'll get back to the old style of working in offices or will this remain a trend from now on? No. No. Really? Never. Oh, permanent change. Permanent change, right? Permanent change. I have one colleague that stayed in a, in a session said, I will never, ever in any organization work five days a week from the office anymore. Not in Deloitte, mm. not anywhere else. So, no, this is... Uh, and it is also because it brings opportunity. It will actually help us to be more digital, embrace the uh, digital opportunity. So I would not even consider going back because it will only basically, let's say, do harm. I see, I see, I see, I see. So, um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm getting so many questions here. Okay. Um, this one's from Rodrigo. This, this will have to be our last one. Um, considering uh, technology is only an enabler, Rodrigo says, what are the top three recommendations we can all follow to foster collaboration within our organizations and teams? So let's imagine, Martin, for this last one, we've got a team, they're sitting there, we need to like give them three, three suggestions on how to collaborate how to work together. I'm going to take a shot at one and I'll let you do the last two. I'm gonna actually distill your idea because you seem to have all the good ideas in this call. And that was, it's, it's about casting the right people in. You know, If you're gonna build something, have builders. I would say advice number one is actually make sure you cast and recruit the right people. Make sure that they are open, curious, and by default, find joy in working with others. That's my first one, the casting. How else are we gonna transform this team? We've got the right people in the room. We've got two more recommendations to make them collaborate. What's your thoughts? Okay, I will, I will sandwich those, uh, Mike. Um, and I don't agree that I only have the good answer. I think it's, the, it's about the chemistry, but the first one <laughs> before the right people is having a very clear ambition and direction. What do you wanna yeah. achieve? And then you have the right people. And then the last one is accommodate for success. So we architecture or architecture in such a way, we call it redesign in the work environment that you actually have, let's say technology work for you in doing the dull, dangerous and uh, dirty jobs and having the people doing the smart, decisive value creation and value capture kind of jobs. And if you have that governance or that setup right with the right people and you have a very clear mutual ambition, and there can be a lot of things going wrong, but if it goes wrong, you know how to pivot that and how to navigate, re-navigate your journey going forward. I think, it, and it sounds simple, it isn't, but it's again, if you apply it as a mindset and everyone understands that and and the, 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 the final one is maybe don't get stuck and don't hire managers. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. I, I think I did, I did a talk on the future of work. I think managers in the old sense will be dead. We will not see any managers in five to 10 years anymore. Yeah. You, you must be a creator of some sort, right? You must produce. You must contribute, yeah. right? Yeah. Coordination. Coordination is... So that's typically the efficiency base. It's all about it's a synchronizing and coordination amongst different kinds of participants. That's typically the old fashioned efficiency model that works very well in the first and the second uh, industrial revolution, but is not set up for agile or the more digital age. So we have to apply a different kind of model uh, that is not yeah. based on that. Well, Martin, we have, we've smashed only some of the, the questions. I think we've done a good job in that. Um, I, I wanted to ask you just before we wrap up, um, having gone through these tech and collaboration trends, 
Um, where does it leave you in, in how you see the world we're in now? We've sort of charged you up with these eight trends. Is there, is there one of them in particular that has sparked something in your mind or got to top of the list now that we've had the chance to talk about them? Is there one of them that you think really stands alone? Now, I, uh, although I am all about choice making, I think the good thing about this, this survey and this report, Mike, is that it is quite consistent over the different elements. So if I would pick a few, it starts with understanding this user experience. And mm. maybe that, that requires that you have this, let's say, uh, single source of truth and that you have, and, and ultimately ends up with engagement. Uh, so mm. UX in itself uh, is nothing. It is basically, if you measure that the engagement is up, that people are actually liking the UX, that's where you basically make the circle around. So if you take elements out of the report um, and really understand how to work with that, uh, I think you are in a very good place. I think that's, that's the value of this. Although I'm a lot focused on long-term strategy, if you don't understand this, if you don't understand the zoom in, you just end up very, with a visionary zoom out and that yeah. doesn't bring results. It, so F strategy for me is all about execution. And the zoom out would actually help you to set direction and to know where you're heading. But if you can't execute, it has been a worthless journey for me as well. So. That's also why I collaborate with guys like you, because I'm not a builder. I'm a strategist. I can help people make sense of everything that's out there and how to basically make the right choices. But then I need partners that bring a capability to actually take that ID and build, build it into a prototype that actually works, creates value, et cetera. So besides you guys, I, of course, a lot of a network of people that will help me on areas where I'm really not good I know what I, what I do quite well, and that's why I connect very well, because there's a mutual, I would say, symbiosis right. between what we do. And if you can yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. connect on content and ambition, everyone wants to work with you, mm. inside mm. or outside your organization. Well, Martin, it sounds like when, when we, we are officially able to attend parties in Bucharest, instead of going as Batman and Robin like we normally do, <laughs> you can be Zoom out and I'll be Zoom in. It'll yeah, be great. Let's, let's, let's do that. <laughs> Listen, Martin, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Um, it has been great to get your feedback, your builds, your Zoom outs on our Zoom ins. Uh, once again, it's another great chapter in us working together personally. So I'm really appreciative of your time and your effort. Um, don't forget for all of the people that have tuned in, I can see from all around the world, number one, we will have another Qualitalks in a month from now. I'm very excited. Uh, we will have a one of the most collaborative product owners we've worked with in recent times, Martin. Uh, hint, hint, it's a bank with a black and gold logo, if that, if that helps. So uh, really, we're going to follow up on the collaboration trend and talk to someone who's one of the best collaborators uh, we as Qualitons have worked with. So make sure you come back for the next uh, Quality Talks. If anyone who has attended this webinar is thinking, I want the deck, good news, head to bottomup.io, where you can take not only the deck, but the full course for emerging trends in 2021. Thank you to you, Martin. Thank you to all of the people that have tuned in today for this uh, webinar. It has been great to get all your feedback and your questions. If you want to know anything more about Qualitons, you head over to qualitons.com. If you want to get the emerging trends course, you head over to bottomup.io. Thank you, everyone. For those of you who are at this late at night, sleep well, jump in your pajamas. And for those of you, Martin, you shouldn't jump in your pajamas. You nope. can stay in your suit. That's, that's a good job. Thank you again, Martin. Thank you to all of our audience. It's been truly wonderful. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Mike. It's my pleasure. Bye-bye, mate. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.